اوكي السلام عليكم آه شكرا لحضوركم آه اليوم عندنا المحاضره الثالثه من محاضرات الليبيان كاردك سوسايتي للاي بي وان شاء الله الدكتور عبد المنيب بن نواره حي هيز جونا بريزنت التوك اليوم الدكتور عبد المنيب يشتغل في اونتاريو كندا اسوشيت بروفيسور ماك ماستر يونيفرستي توك زي ما قلنا هي بيس ميكر مانجمنت اند ترابل شوتنج ان ميجيك سيتنج عندنا مشكورين الدكتور اسام هليل جزء من الاكسبرت بانل وايضا مشكوره الدكتوره ناديه السني في يو كي شيز الكتروفيسيولوجيست فان شاء الله تكون محاضره ممتعه ولوكينج فورورد لمحاضره الدكتور عبد الغني الدكتور عبد الغني الفلور از اول يورز ابدا ان شاء الله اوكي السلام عليكم جميعا ان شاء الله تكونوا بخير Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I am not an electrophysiologist, but I am a device specialist. Um, actually, I'm an interventional cardiologist with certain extra training, training including uh, this uh, device training. And um, I'm very interested in devices, including pacemakers and ICDs. Um, so I was uh, approached to present a talk about pacemaker management and troubleshooting in emergency setting. And these are my conflict of interest uh, with different pharmaceutical companies. The objectives of this talk would be to discuss, uh, inshallah, the common pacing system problems that we face, especially in uh, setting uh, of the emergency situations and shortly after implantation of the devices. Do you hear me okay, guys? Yes, go ahead. I mean, that's my thing. And if you had the smash, please uh, mention the, the chat box. But if you have the chat box, go ahead. Definitely. Uh, so the first objective is to discuss the common pacing uh, system problems and then to review how to troubleshoot those pacing system problems, uh, which would include define the pacing system problem identify the cause of the problem, then solve the problem. When I say pacing system, that means the pacemaker and its leads, including the parks and connections and the leads themselves. And that's the pacing system. Um, as you know, the if you see the arrow here, that's the, the can on the box, which is in the left upper chest, connected the two leads, the atrial lead sitting in the right atrium and the left ventricle and the right ventricular lead sitting in the right ventricle towards the apex. This system connected and um, gets the information and the uh, stimulation to the heart to make sure that speeds uh, in the normal synchronous um, rhythm, so called AV sequential pacing. So the atrial lead connected to the atrium, but also talks to the uh, ventricular lead and both uh, work together in harmony, similar to the gut given pacing system to some extent. And um, I'm not going to talk about CRT. I don't, I don't put CRTs, but this is another uh, third lead that goes through the coronary science towards the left ventricle from behind the heart. Uh, that's another uh, lead that um, sometimes you see uh, if a patient comes with uh, acute sitting after CRT uh, implantation. So just to keep that in mind, so we have single lead, dual lead and CRT pacing. Um, so just to go back to the basics of pacemaker function, pacemaker function is not only giving pacing uh, to the heart and that's it, but it, um, number one stimulates the cardiac um, uh, muscle and causes cardiac depolarization and we call pacing. Also senses the intrinsic cardiac function. So it actually inhibits itself. So you may have a pacemaker that's sitting there, or it's not working. Uh, I mean, it's not pacing, it's working, it's watching. Um, and that be that's because of this function, it inhibits itself because it's on demand. It's not like the previously very old pacemakers when you have to continuously pace the heart regardless. All the new pacemaker systems are on demand. So it inhibits itself when necessary. The other one is respond to increase metabolic demand and the so-called rate response. So if the heart rate is always fixed at 60 per minute and the patient doing activity, we have this 
uh, function called rate response. The heart rate goes up automatically by the pacemaker sensing the metabolic function and pH and muscle movements and increase the heart rate up to the upper heart rate allowed by the pacemaker setting. Also, it provides diagnostic information. So pacemaker is actually 24 seven monitor that's sitting there, but you have to turn that function on. So that way it works as a diagnostic um, device that you can get the rhythm, especially if you have dual chamber pacemaker, you'll have lots of information um, to provide you uh, when you integrate the pacemaker. And um, there are other functions that are more advanced, like uh, the so-called uh, RR and CLs. Uh, these are more advanced functions. Uh, we can talk about them later if necessary. Uh, for the juniors, you uh, have to, uh, to know the basics of uh, pacemaker um, function and also uh, location of the leads. Based on this, you can understand when you see a rhythm, uh, is it uh, dual chamber, single chamber, is there a rate response? So for example here, if you have this, something called D, 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 that means the pace, uh, dual chamber, that means ventricular paste and arterial paste and also chamber sensed, ventricular sensed, and atrial sensed, and also rate respond, response to sensing. So you have dual sensing, either inhibition or triggering. And then you have the rate responses, and if the fourth number, which we said about that, we mentioned about that, is the rate response. And the fifth one, don't worry about it, we don't use that that commonly. Uh, the, this picture from our pacemaker clinic, you can see the, how big those pacemakers were, and the were very um, um, preliminary. These pacemakers last only for a few months, some of them, and they are very heavy. They have lots of issues and complications from those pacemakers. Um, this is just part of the history. And now these are the new pacemakers. Most of them are small, like this one here. And uh, they have um, more longevity. So they're the uh, expected uh, longevity of the pacemakers is, is very high, up to 10 to 15 years these days. Uh, and they're very small, very convenient with less risk of complications. These are the types of leads um, we have. The most common leads we use are uh, these so-called uh, passive leads. That means you put the lead and this uh, fence will attach themselves to the trabeculae of the um, ventricle or the atrium. And you have here the active leads. That means you need to screw it in the atrium or the ventricle and attach themselves to the, uh, my, to the myocardium. And these are epicardial lead, and these are outside of the heart, on the surface of the heart. Uh, these are done by cardiac surgery. So that uh, three different types of leads, active leads, passive leads, and epicardial leads. Uh, from the history standpoint, uh, first uh, atrial triggered pacemaker was implanted in 1960. In 1964, um, the first uh, demand pacemaker was um, was found. In 1977, first AV um, demand pacemaker was also found. In 1980, first successful pacemaker intervention for SVT was done. From that, the pacemakers started to become more advanced uh, until the end of the uh, 80s and more advanced afterwards. Here, just to remind you about single lead pacemaker. So you have to look at the pacing system itself pacemaker, and then the lead goes through the severe vena cava down to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, and always look at the tip of the pacemaker. Where's the tip? Has to be around like the apex or towards the septum, and compare the previous uh, uh, chest X-rays with the uh, chest X-rays in the emergency department. <clears throat> So from here, I'm gonna start uh, talking about just a few things related to the emergency visit for the pacemaker after pacemaker implantation. For those people who see pac patients after pacemaker implantation, I would like to go over um, a normal findings of chest X-ray and ECGs. So be familiar with that. Then after that, we'll go over abnormal findings. So when the pac patient comes to the emergency department with um, symptoms or potential suspected complications, you know the normal or, or the uh, finding that's supposed to be uh, in comparison to the abnormal or the findings that uh, shouldn't be there after pacemaker implantation. That way you can identify the problem quickly and communicate with the patient, with the uh, physician or the cardiologist or the implanter quicker that way, or you may even 
not even need to contact anybody, just send the patients home if you're comfortable and everything is good. So this is a, another um, dual chamber pacemaker. This is in a good position, pacemaker. So you have the ventricular, uh, ventricular lead at the apex. You have the right atrial lead towards the right atrial appendage and the X-ray looks good, just cardiomegaly and other findings, but these are, uh, these are how it's supposed to be. Uh, this patient has an ICD. So if you see a patient uh, in the emergency department uh, and you're not sure, is it, is it an ICD or is it the pacemaker? So you see, it's easy to identify the, an ICD the, by this ICD cause. So this is a ventricular coil, and this is the severe um, vena cava coil. And that's how that they, they, this, so this clearly a lead is not a simple pacemaker lead, it's an ICD lead and the device itself is slightly bigger. And that's how you differentiate by just X-ray, is it an ICD or a pacemaker? Um, this is a biventricular pacing or CRT. So you have the right ventricular lead and, uh, and also a left ventricular lead or uh, uh, coronary sinus lead. And also this is an ICD, not the pacemaker by seeing the coil also the uh, right ventricular pacemaker coil uh, or ICD coil here. And there's a severe vena cava coil here, which is not as obvious, but this is very obvious an ICD CRT. And this is one of our patients. When uh, we finish the pacemaker, uh, you'll see a bandage on the top of the pacemaker. Every center has its, uh, its approach uh, how to cover the site, but that's what we do. And after a few months, that's the scar we see. It's almost uh, unseen. Uh, so there's no need to put a huge scar, uh, just a small scar that uh, can be uh, cosmetic to uh, patients and uh, switch it in a certain way to make it appear as uh, clear to the skin or near the old skin as possible without making uh, lots of uh, interruption to the skin and has to be a horizontal that way the scar will be less visible. So this is a Patient came to the emergency department after a pacemaker implantation with chest pain. Um, so we see here an atrial pace rhythm, ventricular sense rhythm. So the ventricle is triggered, is not activated, but the atrium is um, active and it's pacing. And so this is a normal pacemaker function, but that shouldn't uh, distract us from the other findings. So the patient has pacemaker a few days ago, came with chest pain, doesn't mean that everything is related to the pacemaker. So we have to look everywhere. And the other message from this ECG is um, we know in ventricular pace rhythm, you can't interpret the, uh, pace, the ECG, but if the, uh, if the pacemaker is dual chamber and the atrium is uh, active and ventricular is triggered, uh, is not triggered, is, 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 um, is not active. That means it's AV sequential with A pace V sensed. That way you can interpret the ECG. So A, paste V sensed, you can interpret the ECG, but if you have V paste V sensed, V paste, and uh, you may not be able to interpret unless you have certain things. Here, this patient has chest pain and there's a steel elevation in the inferior leads. So we have to make sure the pacemaker, everything is good from that part, but also this patient needs to go to the cath lab urgently. And there's clear uh, sprocal changes in the lateral leads and um, anterior septal lead cystic depression. So this patient came with the chest pain after pacemaker implantation, make sure that everything's going well uh, from the pacemaker part, but also we have to act quickly upon this as this patient has acute STEMI. Also this ECG shows uh, ventricular pace rhythm, which is a common finding we see uh, the, with the pacemaker ECGs is when we look at the ECG, we just look at the pacemaker, sometimes we forget everything else, but this patient has also underlying newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So make sure when you have an ECG, look at everything and don't forget because this patient requires um, uh, anticoagulation and um, make sure that uh, you address that. The pacemaker is working well and everything is good, but the patient, may, the patient developed AFib so we have to deal with that and anticoagulate the patient and usual therapy for that. Here's AB sequential pacing. So A sensed V, uh, sorry, A paced, V paced, um, and it's normal pacemaker function. Just to remember that uh, there's no issue with the pacemakers working as supposed to be. And here is also a um, pacemaker that's working well, but this is an eye uh, uh, pacemaker with dual uh, pacing in the ventricle, which is, uh, ICD and CRT. 
And you know that from uh, V1 and V2, V1 is on top here, and you see there are two small spikes before the uh, QRS, one here and one here, and the atrium as well. So it's uh, by the pacing. Pacemakers are in increasing in numbers, and we can see that clearly in our center, uh, the numbers are growing. Uh, so uh, from that, you expect to see more um, complications coming to the emergency department. So we have to be aware of that. And the numbers are going uh, clearly, both from ICD and CR and, and pacemakers, but pacemakers definitely way more. Um, uh, the pacemaker malfunction complications can happen everywhere. This is uh, an article from JAMA and uh, seems to be a wide, um, large number of patients um, were involved in this. Um, and the complication rate and pacemaker malfunction up to 0.4% uh, with about 30 uh, deaths directed, attributed, directly attributed to the pacemaker malfunction. And this is an old data from the 80s. Uh, these numbers most likely are way less now with the advanced technologies we have and advanced techniques. And you can see the rate of complications uh, were very, very, very high in the early 80s and went down dramatically by the end of the 80s, 1980s. Um, and here is the, um, when you have a center that uh, has large volume, so you may expect a large number of uh, patients coming there with some complications, but uh, shouldn't be very uh, alarming. Like here uh, in, in this center, this is uh, uh, in 2002, there was a spike in uh, pacemaker lead uh, malfunction, and that's a manufacturer problem. So if you see something that's alarming, you have to look, is it a problem with the operator, problem with the manufacturer? Uh, so it happened to our center a few years ago when uh, one of the leads uh, were defaulty and uh, we saw a few issues with it. So we needed to speak to the company and change that. So it's not always related to the operator. So maybe from the device itself. This is from Mayo Clinic, um, rate of complications. It can, uh, can be anywhere and, can, uh, and, and the complications can be uh, in any uh, part of the um, access towards the system from the site until the heart. For example, you have vascular access related problems you have hematomas, air embolism, pneumothorax, uh, lead uh, placement issues, uh, infection, pocket pain, perforation, coronary sinus perforation, arrhythmias, erosions, and also malfunction, um, like mechanical malfunction, uh, sensing problems, device failure. So those things uh, we have to remember when you see patients in the emergency department can be anywhere and complications are not common, thankfully, but uh, can happen. So we have to be open-minded for that. So for anyone who sees patients in the emergency department after pacemaker implantation, we go to the basics by taking history, quick history and physical exam. Make sure you look at the site of the pacemaker, listen to the ch chest of the patient and the heart. Uh, and also uh, symptoms. Is it dizziness, syncope, shortness of breath, palpitations? Um, again, look at the uh, pacemaker. Uh, if there's a card or information about the pacemaker, we always give a card that has information, a uh, temporary card at the beginning, then permanent card comes in a few weeks. But the patient should have information about the pacemaker, including the, the type of leads, the type of device, uh, date of manufacture, date of procedure, manufacture company. So you have to be aware of that because if you want to do interrogation, you need those information, especially the company and the manufacturer. And um, if there's any recent integration to the pacemaker, that would be helpful. And uh, check the vitals of the patient, obviously, especially if there's any issues with the heart, like bradycardia, hypotension, heart failure symptoms. And then you, you take basic lab, ECG, chest X-ray, very important. These three things. So basic blood work, ECG, and chest X-ray for the patient with the symptoms after pacemaker, especially recent pacemaker implantation. And if, if you think it's related to the pacemaker, so do an ECG and chest X-ray, routine blood work, and you deal with the patient the usual way. You may uh, use a magnet. If you're comfortable, you can put the magnet on the pacemaker. If there's an issue and you think or suspect that the pacemaker problem, that magnet will help you to take the pacemaker to the magnet rate, and that will help you to determine if there's an issue or not. And we'll talk about that a bit later. And also you may proceed to the interrogation uh, which is uh, will give you the uh, final answer about what's going on.
Here, as a patient came after a few days, uh, actually a day after the pacemaker implantation, and uh, you can see a right ventricular lead, right atrial lead. Uh, it's a right-sided, usually you put it in the left side, but this patient, uh, unfortunately, had the pacemaker, seems to be a pacemaker on the right side. Maybe there was an access issues on the left side. Uh, anyways, so it came with shortness of breath, and you can see typical large pneumothorax. It's actually tension pneumothorax. And uh, also it pulled the lead back a little bit, the right atrial lead and right ventricular lead are pulled back a little bit because of tension pneumothorax. So uh, we have, to, this needs uh, urgent attention with chest tube. And also we need to integrate the pacemaker and make sure it's working well. So um, always look at the chest X-ray, make sure looking specifically for certain things like lead position. And if there's a pneumothorax, if there's large cardiomegaly, Try to compare it with the previous chest X-ray before this presentation. That would be helpful too. Um, and here is um, right atrial lead dislodgement. Right ventricular lead seems to be in uh, an okay position, but the right atrial lead is supposed to be up here and it's dislodged, so that uh, has to be repositioned. Um, just just to show you, uh, sometimes you see unusual uh, locations like this patient has dextrocardia. So you have to be prepared and you may see that, uh, but it's in good position. There is no issue with the lead, it seems to be in good position. And uh, this lead supposed to be in the apex, but towards the septum, that's fine. Some of us put it in the septum and there's a new actually his bundle pacing that actually you can, we may see it in the upper septum or in the RBOT. So look at the previous X-ray, uh, see the notes from the operator before you decide and say, oh, this lead has dislodged. So this lead is still in good position, but it's towards the septum. And uh, it's a new technique that we use for bundle, his bundle pacing or lift, uh, lift bundle branch block pacing. Here is a rare uh, problem that uh, sometimes we see a few days after a pacemaker implantation, which is so-called twiddle syndrome. When the patient is playing with the pacemaker and twisting it in the pocket and that, uh, uh, pulls the lead back. So if you see here, the leads are actually coiled under the pacemaker and the lead is pulled back. Um, so fortunately you have to put this back, the lead towards its position and ask the patient not to touch the pacemaker anymore and make sure you fix the pacemaker with suturing uh, to make sure it's secured and doesn't move. Here is an old pacemaker. Uh, patient, this patient likely will come with loss of capture and pacemaker malfunction and that's because if the uh, lead is crashed between the clavicle and the first rib and broken and damaged so this is called uh, um, lead uh, clavicular uh, first rib uh, crash syndrome and uh, this patient needs a new pacemaker lead and to avoid that we prefer to use the cephalic vein so you come the lead comes from here towards the uh, uh, subclavian uh, vein uh, rather than to get it directly to the subclavian vein uh, and that way you prevent this uh, kind of problem in the future. Usually this happens uh, several years after the implantation. Uh, you may see a patient comes, uh, this for the operators. Uh, this is where I have seen a couple of patients with uh, nerve stimulation uh, devices. Uh, and what you do about that, patient comes, this patient comes with a complete heart block. So I needed to speak to the company to make sure there is no interference with the new pacemaker. And eventually a patient got a pacemaker and everything went very well. So you may see two devices like this, uh, if, you're, if there's a neurology system uh, and a cardiology system. So this pacemaker, and this is a, a, a nerve stimulation that goes to the brain and this goes to the heart. Uh, this is not an uncommon problem, thankfully, but you may see it. So always if a patient comes with fever or pain in the site, you have to look at the site to make sure uh, there's no infection like this here, uh, pacemaker site infection. And this pacemaker has to be uh, removed and uh, the uh, pacemaker has to be put in the other side. But before that, make sure that the patient is not dependent and make sure that the pacemaker uh, is, um, is functioning. And then you decide based on the need, if they need, uh, there's a need for a temporary pacemaker or you just need to insert the new pacemaker from the other side, but definitely needs to be admitted, antibiotics and blood cultures, et cetera. The usual, the usual treatment for any kind of infection. Uh, this is an old pacemaker, so if patient comes with pain or something, you have to look at the site. Unfortunately, uh, this pacemaker has eroded and also infected. So again, the same thing has to be 
uh, admitted, start on antibiotics, and uh, you see if there's a need for temporary pacemaker or new pace or, or or just to add a new pacemaker from the other side. But definitely, this has to be removed, and a new pacemaker has to be implanted from the other side. This can be potentially serious because the patient might get septicemia and get septic shock and endocarditis, uh, so have to act quickly. Uh, similar problem here with the pacemaker eroded, so the same thing. So always we have to look at the pacemaker side when you see a patient comes to the emergency department, especially if there's a pain in the side. But uh, in the clinic, if there, if, there is, if there is a pacemaker clinic, I always mention to my technicians to always look at the site before you interrogate the pacemaker. Sometimes they're in hurry and they just do the interrogation without looking, but it's a standard of care in our center is they, they have to look at the site. And uh, once a year or every two years, we see things like that, especially with all patients who forget or they don't show up for their appointments, they end up with issues that uh, can be missed. Um, here is, uh, I mentioned that about the treatment. Uh, patient comes uh, after sometimes a few days or even uh, longer with uh, swelling in the pacemaker. Usually it's because of hematoma or bleeding under the pacemaker or infection. So you have to also to deal with that. And uh, again, you need to treat that with antibiotics and make sure there's no other issues going on. Um, so for the troubleshooting in general, uh, to summarize, I still have a few slides to go, but just to remind you that we, when we see a patient in the pacemaker clinic or in the emergency department, especially in an emergency setting, always see what's the problem. Identify the problem and make sure, see the cause of the problem, what's, causing, what's going on, and then you solve the problem. So three steps, very, very important. to uh, Define the problem, what's the problem? Is it under-sensing, over-sensing? and then and define, identify the cause of it, and then solve it. And, uh, and that, this is an article from Mayo Clinic to summarize what I have said uh, about the, when you see a pacemaker with malfunction or suspected malfunction to see number one, is there a pacing stimulus? What pacing stimulus is, is the pacing spike. When you see, is there a pacing spike or not? If yes, then is it capturing or not? If it's capturing, and pacing properly, and that's normal. That's it. You don't need anything else. But if there's, if it's uh, not capturing well, then uh, you may need to integrate the device. Make sure consider uh, malfunction or consider an artifact. But you need to do something. Um, if the pace, if the pacing is appropriate, um, and that's fine. But sometimes the pace, pacing is not appropriate, then you have to see is it over sensing or under sensing. Over sensing, in other words, is under pacing. So we don't see a pacing spike where it's supposed to be. That's over sensing. Over sensing is under pacing. And the opposite is under, under sensing. Under sensing, that means it's over pacing. You see a pacing spike where it's not supposed to be. So that's over uh, pacing or the other, uh, the terminology we use is under, under sensing. And uh, there are lots of reasons for that. The other side, if you see a patient, patient with a pacemaker and you suspect malfunction, uh, so again, so if the pacing stimulus or spike is not there, that means pacemaker either working very well and normal function, and that means the intrinsic rhythm is there, and the, pacing, the pacemaker is inhibiting itself. And uh, so if, uh, if not, if the intrinsic rhythm is not there, uh, that means the pace, pacemaker, um, you have to check with the magnet. You put the magnet on and see if you see uh, the pacemaker is functioning at the magnet rate, which is usually 80 to 100 beats per minute. That means there is an oversensing problem or electrical uh, interference, certain things like that. So have to use the magnet to help you determine is it an intrinsic problem with the uh, with the pace, a pacemaker, or if the intrinsic rhythm is good, the rate is appropriate, that's good, but always try to apply the magnet to make sure, just to see what is the underlying rhythm, make sure that, especially if it's dual chamber, both leads are working or one lead is working, that's very good test in the emergency department to apply the magnet. So 
To avoid confusion, just gonna go quickly back here. So you have pacing stimulus, present or not. That means pacing spike is, is there or not when you see pacing. If you see it, uh, that means it's capturing or not. If it's capturing, that's okay, that's good. But if not, is not the pacing is not appropriate. You may see something is not uh, in the in the right spot. Then either over sensing or under sensing. And we said over sensing, you see, uh, which is under pacing. You see a pacing. You don't see a pacing spike where it's supposed to be. Or over or under sensing, uh, which is over pacing. You see a pacing spike where it's not supposed to be. Now you go to the other side here, which is uh, the if you have uh, no no capture that's easy if, uh, you have to integrate the pacemaker and look uh, for the cause of it but don't forget if there's mechanical failure or artifact or drugs or metabolic that might also cause that now to the other side i said if there's an intrinsic activity that's easy that means the pacemaker is actually on demand and watching but you're not sure so you apply the magnet to make sure and if you see a magnet uh, here that that's if it's working that's okay if not, then you have to look for mechanical failure. Always remember the magnet will help you to determine if it's mechanical failure, uh, if it's intrinsic rhythm. And uh, and if it's uh, if there is no intrinsic rhythm, it will be probably over sensing. In, um, in this setting, the magnet will help you, but also you have to consult with the uh, cardiology and do the interrogation. Interrogation is the golden standard approach for those patients. This is just a, uh, um, a reminder and might help a little bit. You don't need to remember everything, but just uh, to remind uh, and try to go over that later. Um, so again, for we mentioned about the pacing system, uh, through malfunction, uh, like loss of capture, sensing, under sensing, and over sensing, and pseudo malfunction. So there are three things when you see a pacemaker and ECG. Is it normal functioning or not? If it's not, then maybe through malfunction like loss of capture or sensing, over sensing or under sensing, or sometimes pseudo malfunction. Uh, and I'll speak to, I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, loss of capture, we know all of that, all of us, we know loss of capture is, is uh, when there's a failure of the stimulus or the spike to produce electrical activity in the heart. That means there's a pacing spike is not in the right position. It can be from the atrium or both, or, or ventricle or atrium or both. Uh, and like here, you have, intermittent loss of capture. So there's a clear spike that's not supposed to be where it's supposed to be. Here, just showing you the other rhythm here under under here. So here is actually the pacemaker is working well because you have pacing spikes then followed by a normal QRS. So the pace, pacemaker inhibits itself. So there's good sensing and then pacing and another, spot, another uh, normal activity came out. So the pacemaker inhibits itself and so on. So the first uh, step on the top is loss of capture clearly, but the second one is actually normal function of the pacemaker. And here again, there's spikes, uh, small tiny spikes, there's complete loss of capture. And uh, this pacemaker has to be interrogated and look for the cause as we mentioned. This is a uh, patient under in the surgery, there's interference from the electrocutary. So we have to be careful when you use cutary and that can interfere with the pacemaker and causes pacemaker uh, interruption to the electrical activity because of that fact comes from the electrocautery. Here's, um, you have over uh, under sensing, which is over pacing. So there are, sub, there are spikes where, uh, where are not supposed to be here and here. Uh, uh, and this is a ventricular lead, ventricular lead uh, under uh, sensing and uh, that causes loss of capture. So sometimes uh, under sensing or over sensing can be combined with loss of capture. Doesn't mean that they have to be separate. So just remind that that's a typical example when there is under sensing causing uh, loss of capture. And uh, most common uh, in early setting is lead dislodgement uh, or malposition, which is not uncommon. So you do it in X-ray and ECG, and then you decide about lead repositioning with the cardiologist. Here is right arterial lead dislodged to the ventricle. So you have a uh, pacemaker in the upper right. Uh, and uh, you have two spikes, one in the right before the, the QRS, before the ventricle, and the other one before the, uh, or just before the QRS, the first one, which is from the atrial lead and this from the ventricular lead. So there are two, two of them, and that's because of the atrial lead dislodgement. Uh, 
Overcensing, which is under pacing. So we see here a drop uh, P wave are supposed to be a few hours here with paste. Uh, that's an over uh, sensing. So we need to check why the pace patient and the one this over sensing and then to treat if there's any need to, uh, for read, uh, lead repositioning or uh, placement depends on the cause of that. Um, again, this is another typical example of under sensing when you see pacing spikes where uh, are not supposed to be uh, on the QRS here. And that uh, also can be from lead uh, malposition. And here, for example, because of T wave, T wave or the something called far field signals sometimes can cause uh, under sensing and over pacing where uh, pacemaker spikes are in the position where not supposed to be. Um, again, you need to integrate the pacemaker and see the QR, the, the R wave and how big these, uh, the sensing or, or the R wave. And then you decide based on the uh, threshold if needed, uh, anything to be done and also do an X-ray to make sure the lead is in good position. Uh, here, sometimes you see in the um, emergency or if the patient moves and removes the, the uh, uh, lead, uh, the, the ECG or the monitor leads, and that can cause artifact like this. This is not the pacemaker problem. This is a, the leads from the pacemaker was disconnected. So uh, just to make sure that it did good alarm by this. So this is an artifact. And uh, just to repeat that and make sure that everything is, is good, but this is clearly an artifact and nothing uh, alarming. Like this one also, sometimes there's interference and causing uh, artifacts like this. I have seen this several times. Uh, again, it's not a problem. Just to repeat the ECG, make sure the patient's not moving and no other interference. Okay, Ma magnet operation. If you put the magnet, that will take the patient rate uh, to the magnet rate, which is uh, 80 to 100 per minute. To the uh, and uh, that's a normal uh, rate sometimes uh, in the OR you, we see that so that's normal function if you see it in the OR or in emergency and that will help you to determine if there's any problem with the pacemaker also uh, to apply a magnet so um, pacemaker tachycardia <clears throat> pacemaker immediate tachycardia I think uh, that was uh, covered in the previous presentations uh, uh, but it is uh, a rapid pacing rate at the upper rate of the pacemaker. It happens only in dual chamber. So remember, it doesn't happen in the single chamber. It's only in dual chamber pacemaker. And that's how it looks like. You have uh, a stimulus that triggered the ventricular lead from the tip. For example, PVC or PAC or arterial loss of capture triggered an extra activity. It goes to the right arterial lead towards the can and then goes back to the uh, ventricular lead. And this is like a re-entry tachycardia. So it's a, some sort of re-entry tachycardia involves uh, both leads and the myocardium and also the CAN. And this can uh, go forever, so it has to be interrupted. The best way to interrupt it is to put the magnet and remove it quickly. However, remember, if you put the magnet in a patient, sometimes might, that might also trigger PMT. So you have to be careful and uh, look at the patient and put it and do this under the monitor and, uh, and remove the magnet quickly uh, to see if that interrupts the uh, PMT. Uh, the other uh, treatment for that is the, uh, the so-called uh, increase the, uh, the uh, P-VARB. Here's the P-VARB with uh, post-ventricular artery refractory period. And that by doing that, usually I increase it by 50 points and that should take care of it and prevent it from coming back. The third therapy is to treat the PVCs and PACs. We usually ask the uh, physician who is looking after the patient or if, if it is your patient to increase beta blockers or add beta blockers or calcium channel blockers to get rid of the PVCs to prevent this from happening again. And that's how it looks like on ECG. And this is continuous uh, upper rate uh, pacing. That's typical PMT, but make sure there is nothing else. It's not tracking or not uh, uh, an issue with the rhythm with the patient. And the best way and easiest way, just put the magnet and remove it quickly, and that should interrupt it if it's PMT. That's very easy. Rate response, this patient is running. So if you see a patient uh, running on a monitor, has a monitor, you may see an upper rate of pacemaker or tracking if there's a tracking uh, uh, like atrial fibrillation or flatter, and the rate can go up to 130 or 120, depends on the upper rate of the pacemaker. Uh, so this is rate response or tracking uh, rate and uh, pacemaker function is normal uh, in this case, but uh, it has to be integrated if there's a question or suspected malfunction, which is less likely in this case. Um, common questions about uh, pacemaker, like uh, the patients will ask 
in the emergency department or somewhere else. Uh, they can use the cell phones. Cell phones are okay. Uh, appliances like microwaves and televisions, um, definitely okay. Dental procedures, no issues. Um, and um, MRI, MRI, most of them, the pacemakers now MRI uh, demand pacemakers, but remember to uh, ask the patient or tell the patient to go to the pacemaker clinic to switch them to the MRI mode. And remember uh, this to be avoided in the first six weeks after implantation. So after implantation six weeks, anytime the patient can have MRI, as long as they go to the MRI clinic, to, to the pacemaker clinic to have MRI mode switched on. And after the MRI, they go back to turn that mode off. But it's not contraindicated in the new pacemakers, but make sure that the pacemaker is in MRI compatible. Surgery and electrocautery, as long as it's five or 10 uh, centimeters away from the area, that's fine. Uh, we may consider uh, put a magnet or switch it to asynchronous mode. That's another option. We consider integration after the after procedure if necessary. And uh, I mentioned about the trans nerve stimulation early on radiation uh, you, to be avoided uh, any radiation directly on the pacemaker, except if it's uh, low dose radiation, that's fine. If it's high dose radiation should be avoided. Uh, sometimes you move the pacemaker to the other side and cardioversion is okay as long as it's not done directly on the pacemaker, so it should, should be at least five to 10 centimeters away. The pads should be away from the pacemaker, otherwise can be safely done, There's, it's not contraindicated. Um, here, so again, to remember, remind you, to if you have a problem with the pacemaker or suspected, so you have to, number one, prevent the problem. So do your best to prevent the problem with the implantation and everything. Uh, and to do all the precautions to prevent any complications uh, during implantation. Number two, find the cause of the problem. Uh, is it a device, is it an artifact or something else? Correct the cause of the problem, if it's lead or anything that has to be positioned. And then consult, uh, obviously this is for the emergency department if it's not possible to do anything uh, or you think it's beyond your scope, always consult with cardiology and integration of the pacemaker and use of magnet is, uh, is very important. Here, just quickly to go over the pacemaker interrogation, and that will, um, pacemaker interrogation will give you idea about the function, but also about the diagnosis. Remember, I mentioned early on, pacemaker functions are several, including diagnosis. For example, here, this is an arterial lead, and this is ventricular lead. If you can see, the arterial lead is faster the, than the ventricular lead, and irregular. So the patient has atrial fibrillation, and uh, can be clearly seen uh, on the interrogation. So this is, gives you really good information about the pacemaker and the, the underlying rhythm. Like in this case, atrial fibrillation, so the patient needs uh, anticoagulation. <clears throat> Here's the other way around. So the, the, um, the uh, ventricular lead. And again, this is an atrial fibrillation case also. The atrial lead is faster than the ventricular lead. Okay. But here is uh, the atrial lead is slower uh, and the G and uh, EGM in the atrial lead is slower than the ventricular lead. And so this is a clear uh, indication that the patient has a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so remember, if you have an ICD or a pacemaker to look at the rhythm, that will help you to decide, especially if the patient gets an ICD shock in the emergency department and you're not sure, interrogation will help to determine is it an appropriate or inappropriate uh, shock. Like in this case, it was appropriate shock because of the ventricular tachycardia. Uh, to wrap up, these are new pacemakers, uh, small uh, devices, intracardiac pacemakers. Uh, I have few patients require this if you have if you don't have access. Uh, have lots of dialysis patients and patients who have issues with veins, uh, then you get this uh, device implanted in the ventricle. So if you see a patient uh, with a pacemaker and uh, you do an X-ray, you can't see anything. Then you may consider or know. You know, ask the patient if, there, if there's a card or something that gives you information. Otherwise, look at the chest X-ray. You will see the pacemaker sitting in the right ventricle, and it's wireless. It's um, it's a one-time use uh, device. Um, I think we'll wrap up here. Uh, so my take-home messages um, is always when you see a patient in the emergency department or elsewhere with the suspected pacemaker malfunction or issue, <clears throat> you start with the history and physical examination. Look at the side of the pacemaker and apply a magnet. Try to apply a magnet if you think that might help you. 
and always look at the X-ray and ECG, look at the previous ECGs and chest X-rays, compare them to see if there's an issue with the lead or issue with capture or sensing. And systematic approach for the function, uh, always define the problem, identify the cause of the problem, and then solve the problem. Always ask for help from cardiology. And pacemaker interrogation is the golden uh, standard uh, approach for that, to know what's going on. So you can call the clinic and get the pacemaker interrogation done to help you with the diagnosis and confirmation. Then from there, you decide what uh, way you'll go for the management. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm gonna open it for questions and if there's any other comments. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Abdelhani, Barakallah Feek. Very nice presentation, right on time. في شوية أسئلة هنبدو الأسئلة من الحضور في سؤال من دكتور جب إن patient who has a pacemaker complete heart block pacemaker infection or infective endocarditis specifically what to do how to manage that خلينا نبدو بالدكتورة نادية دكتورة نادية الصني how do you manage a patient who has complete heart block and develop infective endocarditis uh, uh, okay. Assalamu okay. alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, really, uh, yani uhani Dr. Abu Nawara, and a very, very nice, clear, concise, to the point presentation um, with um, anyone can uh, benefit from. Um, uh, and, and thank you for asking me to participate. Um, so um, anyone who has endocarditis, and I'm glad you brought up this point because I actually have a patient exactly like that under my care today with potential aortic root abscess and bioprosthetic aortic valve endocarditis who has transient heart block, uh, complete transient complete heart block and a PR interval of 400 milliseconds. So you hit the, the nail on its head. Um, this patient has staph aureus septicemia. Um, so you don't want to implant something um, that you can't take out because it will get infected. So essentially, you don't want to put anything in the blood pool. But with a, a, a unstable rhythm, the, the risk of asystole is very high. So in these type of patients, I will classify the patient um, into, you know, how long are they likely to require their antibiotics? How soon will they go for surgery? If it's someone who's going for imminent surgery, immediately going for surgery um, because they're unstable otherwise, because they're in heart failure or because they have set off uh, embolic uh, uh, phenomena from their valve, then those patients will go for surgery and have um, likely epicardial leads implanted with, an, uh, with, a, with a pacing device. Um, however, if the patient is unlikely to go immediately for surgery because they need sterilization, um, increasing their chances to have a better outcome without infection. Um, so those patients, I would implant a, a, a semi-permanent system, which is translated to an externalized pacemaker. Um, and that is essentially uh, a pacing lead a transvenous lead that I implant um, from an internal jugular or from a subclavian uh, vein, um, and I attach it to the skin. Um, so it's implanted with a peel away sheath. I attach it to the skin and then on the surface, um, I will uh, put an adhesive that will uh, protect um, and, and, and isolate the lead from an externalized pacemaker uh, device. And usually these are either devices that have been sterilized um, and used um, before with uh, a battery life in them. Um, and because there is no skin to skin contact with the device, I will attach that to the lead and that lead can stay in the blood pool for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and it can render the patient safe from the bradycardia aspect until they go for their surgery. So those are the kind of the two main options. I don't think putting in a, a temporary standard um, uh, temporary pacing wire is 
um, is ideal practice anymore because these patients usually require long duration of antibiotics or preparation. A temporary wire is very commonly something that will move. And if you're putting it um, uh, from uh, other than the neck, so if you're putting it from the groin, you already have a second focus of infection. The patient will have to be lying down in a mobile. So I don't think that is... Um, very um, uh, useful. Um, uh, and I'd be um, keen to hear what your approach is. Um, nicely covered, uh, Dr. Anadia. I think you summarized it nicely. The, uh, the only thing is uh, the uh, when do we re-implant re the device? So my understanding, if it's uh, just to kind of summarize, uh, if it's infective in the carditis, we have to wait seven to 14 days and then make sure blood cultures are negative. If it doesn't involve, involve the valves, then um, if it's on the device itself and the device has been removed, you can reimplant after three days, 72 hours of uh, uh, negative blood cultures. Is that your approach also? Um, uh, if I'm honest, um, I am a bit more conservative in terms of waiting. Um, I, if, a, if, if I've had a device that I've had to take out, then I don't want to rush in and put another device. Um, so if the patient um, has, if a patient is pacing dependent and I've removed a previous infected device, so the endocarditis is on pacing leads, um, I will ensure that the patient has had, if it's on the pacing leads, um, then the patient needs to have at least three weeks of intravenous antibiotics that I will give. Um, and, um, and, and unfortunately, the blood cultures, a lot of the time we sterilize the bloodstream because of the antibiotics, so you won't grow blood cultures anymore. Uh, you won't grow an organism. So uh, for these patients, um, if, if the patient is pacing dependent, then um, yes, probably within, after a week of, of uh, negative inflammatory markers, apyrexia, no sign of infection, um, and they've had three weeks of IV antibiotics, and I'm sure that the infection is more or less gone, I will implant a, a, a pacemaker. For patients who have had endocarditis before, I'd be more in Client for them to have a micro device. So what Dr. Abunawara showed, um, the little um, pacemakers that are leadless. Um, so I'd be inclined for them to have a micro device if possible, if they are suitable, if they're not too frail where I'm worried about the very large venous access in the, in the groin vein. Um, but um, if they are uh, um, non-pacing dependent, then I will wait. Um, uh, if they had a pacemaker for sinus node disease, I will, I will wait until I'm absolutely sure that their infection is gone. Um, so that's for endocarditis for lead related, but endocarditis for valve related, um, again, when it comes to they've had their operation, um, they're, uh, they're pacing dependent, their epicardial wires are 10 days old, where they're concerned about their, the epicardial wires failing, then in that patient, um, I, I would either um, uh, ask the surgeon to put properly at the time of surgery, um, epicardial patches and tunnel them uh, to under the infraclavicular region and attach them to a, a pacemaker uh, box or uh, consider a micra. Or if those options are not available, then um, once they've been sterilized with the six weeks of antibiotics, they're post-surgery, they've had uh, another uh, two weeks of antibiotics and they've not had any source of infection, we'll implant um, a transvenous uh, device um, and then take their epicardial wires out. If I can add, Yusuf, <clears throat> just uh, one uh, quick uh, point is the, uh... I agree with the, the Tornadia's approach. Um, we have to be careful always uh, with those patients because they may end up with septic shock. And uh, if, they, if you put the new pacemaker quickly, they will end up with more endocarditis. So number one, we take the device out. The old, if there is an old device, depends on the extent of the endocarditis. We typically do a TE to make sure and see the extent of the endocarditis and involving the leads or not, or just involving the valves blood cultures, what type of bacteria. So it's had, if it's staph, it's very aggressive. So we have to be careful if it's not um, viridans or something else, that's different. 
And uh, remember, uh, we consult IED to make sure we have a broad spectrum antibiotic coverage for at least four to six weeks. Uh, we do the approach uh, depends on the, if the patient's dependent or not. So we see the percentage of pacing. If patient is 5% pacing, it's different from 100% pacing. So if it's only 5%, I have patients who actually say, okay, I'll follow you quickly, no need to put anything else. Just you're, you're okay, you had a pacemaker before or ICD. Uh, sometimes it's an ICD, you put an ICD vest and wait for a few weeks, nothing else. But if the patient is dependent, uh, where what Dr. Nadia mentioned is to put the new uh, lead, which is pacemaker lead. Uh, we put it as a temporary pacemaker, but it's not the temporary, it's uh, the pacemaker lead in the right uh, IJ connected with the pacemaker device, not the temporary device. It's actually a permanent device, but we keep it outside and patches as uh, 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 just keep it there until we are comfortable to put the permanent one. And the last final point is we bought the pacemaker from the opposite side. So we don't go to the same spot to avoid infection. We go to the opposite side. So be careful, keep that area clean for the future new pacemaker. Uh, thanks both for covering any uh, very uh, comprehensive coverage of this topic. I think uh, the, I don't think there's going to be any other questions uh, regarding this uh, specific uh, topic. Uh, let's have um, uh, two more questions. Usama, Dr. Usama Buzgaya will answer. Like in uh, Dr. Usama, uh, Usama Buswi Rafa Yabda, if I will, Tfadil Usama. Go ahead, if you have a question. Hi, Barakallahu Sheikh, Dr. Abdelghani, excellent presentation. I was just trying to put myself back in my uh, residency years and see what things that might uh, face a resident in the middle of the night. Uh, just simple things, uh, just for, should end the case. Uh, the first one is if a patient comes in with a twitching uh, chest muscle or twitching diaphragm that's very painful after a pacemaker insertion, how do you deal with that? Uh, situation. The second thing is if a patient comes in uh, with a beeping ICD, they say, I hear a beep coming from my device. I don't know what that is. What is that? I'm scared. And they didn't feel, they haven't felt any, um, sometimes they may have felt a, a ther uh, therapy delivered, but sometimes they may have not. And the third question is, uh, if I see a very big hematoma, clearly a hematoma does not look infected, the patient's not septic. Uh, is it okay to put a needle and drain the uh, hematoma because the patient's uncomfortable? Um, and the third thing is sometimes we see ECGs uh, in patients who have a pacemaker, but I can't see the pacemaker spike. So how do I fix that? Ooh, just the last, the last question for even for me to clarify about the, the uh, endocarditis of a device. For patients who are uh, device not valid for patients who are pacemaker dependent and you need to remove the, the system. What do you do in those three days that you said you will wait or three weeks or whatever on antibiotics in that critical period? Nice questions, Usama. Khalini bas Usama Bhili, Dr. Usama Bhili. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, we'll address your questions, uh, Dr. Usama Gusbi. لكن في دكتور اسامه بوزقيه كان عنده سؤال على السبتل فيرسز ايبيكال ار في ليد بليسمنت دكتور اسامه هيليد يو امبلانت بيس ميكرز ف دو يو بريفير انك تحط الليد في السبتل لوكيشن يعني طبعا الليد غونا بي ان ار في دو يو بوت ات هاي اون ذا سبتم اور دو يو بوت ات ان ذا ايبكس واتس يور ابروتش اند وات دو يو ثينك دوز ات ميك ا ديفرنس دكتور اسامه هيليد السلام عليكم شكرا يوسف <تصفيق> أه شكرا أه عبد الغني الحقيقه محاضره قيمه جدا بارك الله فيك غطيت الفندمنتلز اللي هم الحقيقه فيري ديفيكلت انك انت تو اكسبلين تو تو ذا جونيور كوليجز الحقيقه كيف يسالوا فيا يا جماعه البيس ميكر نقول لهم معلومات وبعدين كيف يسالوا يا عميق شويه نقول لهم معلش سامحوني يو هاف تو لوك فور يور باي ات فور يور باي يور سيلف يعني على العموم شكرا بارك الله فيك عبد الغني أه طبعا الليبيان واي از كومبليتلي ديفرنت فروم ذا وات الدكتوره ناديه سيد طبعا الاسئله اللي طرحها دكتور اسامه القصبي هلبه لكن اول تراي تو كومنت عليه حاجه الانفكشن بس طبعا الانفكشن ريت شويه عاليه في ليبيا ايوه سامح انقطع الصوت يا اسامه 
من ناحيه الديفايس ممكن تركز في العاده امبلانتد في الكاتب صح في العاده مش مهتم هلبا بحكايه الانفكشن كنترول وما عندناش انفكشن كنترول وما عندناش انفكشيوس ديزيز ديبارتمنت اكشولي بالمعنى الصحيح ف الانفكشن ريت از از كوايت ا بروبلم بالنسبه للسؤال بتاعك دكتور يوسف على خصوص الليد امبلانتيشن طبعا اي بريفير اولويز تو جو هاي معليش انا كويس انك جبت النقطه هذه لان وي نيد تو ديسكاس ات حتى تو هيلب اور كوليجز في ليبيا هاو هاو على الاقل يكون شويه اورينتيشن ليبيان ليبيان واي اورينتيشن لان وي ار تيك اور تيكينج فروم ديفرنت بيرسبكتيف يعني انت لما في يو هاف سمون وذ انفكتد ديفايس شنو تدير ليبيا واتس يور ابروتش اليوم السؤال الحقيقه آه. اذا كان عندي انفكت ديفايس والبيشنت از ديبندنت طبعا احنا في العاده كل البيشنتس بتاعنا ديبندنت لان المين كوز اوف بيس ميكر امبلانتيشن از كومبليت اي في بلوك فموست اوف ذيم اور ماجورتي اوف ذيم دي ار بيس ميكر ديبندنت فالحقيقه موست اوف ذا تايم تو بي اونست ينحط لهم تمبر بيس ميكر ويقعدوا في الـ في الـ في, الـ في الديبارتمنت ولا في الاي سي يو ممكن حالتين او ثلاثه صوتي قطع دكتور اسامه صوت قطع ممكن نجاوب على الاسئله يا يوسف مش ركبنا ليد بيس ميكر العادي للباكج اوت سايد وقعد قطع الصوت يا اسامه شويه سوري ممكن الانترنت انقطعت مع اوكي يوسف دو يو هير مي؟ دو اي هير يو ناو اوكي تمام اوكي جو ما انيش عارف وين وقفت القصه لكن في تو اور ثري كيسز نتفكر ان احنا حطينا بيس ميكر ليد وحطينا ديفايس اوت سايد في ستيرايل باكج واستنينا على الاقل تو ويكس نين ولت الاريا كلين دين وي امبلانت ذا نيو بيس ميكر فهذا موضوع الانفكشن از ليتل بيت اتس ا نايت مير بالنسبه لنا احنا في ليبيا لان ما عندكش ما عندكش البروبر انتي بايوتكس وما عندكش البروبر بكتريولوجي سوري الانفكشن ديبارتمنت اللي يو كان ديبند اون ذيم فهمتني كيف فحكايه البلاد كلتشر ولا سواب كلتشر فروم ذا انفكتد سايت و type of the bacteria you are dealing with is not the issue in Libya. نعم. بنستغل الوقت السؤال الثاني اللي هو ال 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 lead placement. Do you prefer apical or septal placement? لا طبعا دائما نفضل ال septal إذا أمكن. أي مجد إنك أنت تنقص ال ال width متاع ال 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 curious complex, the best curious complex, على الأقل تعطي more مور ابييرنس ما بين قوسين انك انت مور فيسيولوجيكال بيسنج دان انك انت ابيكال على الاقل تنقص الريسك نتاع البيشنت انه يخش في في هارد فيلير ان ذا فيوتشر فالابيكال اف بوسيبل اذا كان حصل جود باراميترز اي ويل اولويز جو ابيك سوري سبتل سوري هاي سبتل دكتور بنوارة بعدين نسال الدكتور نادي حتى نشوف وش الراي هل دي يو يوجلي يعني مثلا واحد جاك كومبليت هارد بلوك دي ستيل بوت ان ذا سبتم دي يو وري اباوت ليد ديسلوجمنت بالضبط يا سو بس بنعلق كوكلي لوسامه على الانفكشن هي الريت اوف انفكشن احنا عندنا اولموست زيرو يعني الحمد لله لكن هذا اللي احنا نحطه في البيس ميكرز في كومبليت ستيرايل انفايرمنت نديرو بيس ميكرز في الاو ار في كومبليت فريت اوف انفكشن از نوت اكسبتبل هير فممكن think about ان تكون فيها ستيرويد انفايرمنت و how to prevent the infection with pre-procedure pre- antibiotic and surgical technique has to be completely sterile with the environment. Prevention, best, best treatment for infection is prevention. فالسؤال ليك يا يوسف هو yes, prevention. prevention. Uh, شن تعطي الانتي بيتك بس uh, شن الانتي بيتك اللي تعطي فيه during the surgery؟ نعطي في سيفازولين 2 grams one hour before. وبعدين ما احنا ابروتش اللي هو ما هوش يعتبر ايفيدنس بيست لكن ابروتش نعطي في انتي بايوتيك كيفليكس 500 تي اي دي فور 5 دايز فاحنا الريت اوف انفكشن اولموست زيرو هاف نيفر سنت اني بيشنت فور بيس ميكر اكسبلانتيشن ريليتد دايركتلي تو ذا بيس ميكر يس وي هاد اندوكارديتس بيشنت كم وذ اندوكارديتس وذ بيس ميكر فور 10 ييرز 5 ييرز بس نوت ريليتد تو ذا بيس ميكر ذوز بيشنتس جو فور اكسبلانتيشن بس فور دايركتلي ريليتد تو ذا بيس ميكر وي دونت هاف ات So, okay. uh, and the, 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 the
uh, or Olympics. Definitely avoid the free wall for uh, three reasons. Number one is to get the Zaymagal Usama, the best uh, physiological pacing, especially for dual chamber. Mm -hmm. Number two, risk of perforation uh, with th symptoms thick, so you have less risk of perforation, even if there's perforation, it will be less dangerous. Uh, with third, uh, with thirdly, we are trying to improve the left bundle branch pacing or his bundle pacing. We try to approach that area. Okay, Doctor Anadia, do you prefer septal or apical? If you have someone with complete heart block, uh, do you worry about knee dislodgement if you put it uh, yeah, septally? Um, in in the past, in the past, before we had the evidence base, we thought that putting it in the septal will give you more physiological pacing. We now know that a uh, uh, majority of the patients where we think we've put it septally, when we've from CT scan evidence, we found that they are not actually septal. And we find that they are actually more either in the groove between the septum and the anterior free wall or in the anterior free wall. We also know that uh, the incidence of heart block, uh, the incidence of heart failure from pacing induced uh, cardiomyopathy is uh, not different between whether you put it apically or septally. So if you're pacing ventricular myocardium, right, ventricular myocardium, it really doesn't matter. And the evidence points that if you have someone who has LV impairment with an EF below 50% and you expect them to pace uh, uh, with a high pacing burden, so you're saying the patient has complete heart block, so I expect at least if it, in the interim for them to pace for 100% of the time if they're not intermittent or higher percent of the time if they are intermittent and regain. So in these people, if they have LV impairment, I will give them either a CRT device or I will give them um, a, a his bundle or left bundle area pacing. Perfect. If they're someone who has clear cut LV impairment below 35%, then CRT device, because that's where the evidence points to. There is no controversy about the evidence from Scud Heft and various other studies. But if the, if the LV impairment is um, on the milder side, for EF between 45 to 50%, you could argue for his bundle pacing, although we don't as yet. There are ongoing randomized trials, um, and, and, and that is the way we are going. Yeah. Uh, based on block HF study, um, I, I mean, I usually implant a by V uh, if someone's EF is less than 50%. I know that most of the patients were... Uh, Most of them were mildly uh, impaired, mi though, weren't yeah. they? Uh, above 50%, uh, there's an unpublished study that was done, uh, it's, it was by Abbott, uh, that showed there's no benefit of IV pacing if it's above 50%. Like in below 50%, complete hard block, I always uh, put a by V. Yeah, and that, and that's pacing. our that's yeah. our practice. If we expect oh. them to pace with a considerable burden, so 40% or more, we put by V. Even there's data for 20%, yeah, I need the higher the pacing. Yes. Is, yeah. we, we, yeah. we don't know what the number is. That That's yeah. our, our arbitrary, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think if, you know, whether you put it septally or apically, it doesn't mm -hmm. make that much of a difference. Yeah. And then due to the excellent Dr. Osama Al-Ghusbi, very, very practical, great questions, everyday stuff, okay? who are twitching, muscle twitching. So someone comes in with a pacemaker and there's some sort of twitching, okay? Uh, Dr. Anadi, I will we'll reverse. Uh, what would you so, do? How do you manage? So um, these are rapid fire questions. Fantastic. Um, patient has diaphragmatic twitching uh, depending on the device. If the, if the patient has diaphragmatic twitching and the patient has a pacemaker, just a dual chamber or single chamber bratty device, alarm bells need to start ringing that you might have, especially if it's recent implantation, that there might have been a perforation, especially if the lead is apically placed. If the patient has a, a CRT device, then it might be that it's phrenic nerve stimulation. So I think you need to establish what type of device that is, whether you have it on record. If the patient is not your patient and you don't have his records, he doesn't have his car, look at the x-ray, see what type of device he has. Um, so if the patient has a, a single chamber or dual chamber device, 
not a CRT or an ICD even that he's pacing from, um, and and it's it's uh, diaphragmatic twitching. You want to establish whether first they're hemodynamically stable or not, and if they aren't, you go down your ALS or ACLS protocol pathways, if, because you are concerned whether there's a tamponade. But if they're not tamponading and um, and the patient has a CRT, in that case you have to use the programmer. There's no magic way of turning off the diaphragmatic pacing from a CRT device unless you use the programmer. Um, so you, you would need to know what type of device they have and use the programmer appropriately. And either you turn the LV lead off or you reduce the output or you change the polarity depending on where the LV is pacing from or you just turn it, turn it off and wait for the daytime people, the technicians to come and then they can you know, um, uh, interrogate and play with it. But if you're, if you, the patient has, it does not have a CRT device and their diaphragmatic pacing, it's one of two reasons, either that they perforate it and they're pacing the diaphragm directly, um, or because the output on the RV lead is very, very high and you're capturing diaphragm from a very distally placed apical lead. So, and you'd have to work out which is which. So that comes from the diaphragmatic pacing. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, well said. Swari um, Tanim, Dr. Osama, uh, beeping ICD. So someone comes in the emergency room with an ICD that's beeping. So I'll leave, uh, Dr. Abdurani. Uh, what, what do you recommend? Yeah, so, so if the ICD is beeping, there's uh, usually a problem with the uh, battery. Most likely, um, we tell the patient if you hear certain noises, that means an alarm alarming that the battery is uh, maybe getting there. Most of the time, it can be something else. So Depends on the, if, uh, we know ICDs have pacemakers, so make sure the pacemaker function is, is okay. If, he, if he's not pacemaker dependent and there's no shock and he's hemodynamically or she is hemodynamically stable, then we, uh, if it's in the middle of the night, we just wait until the morning and do the interrogation. If you're comfortable with interrogating, so just interrogating the pacemaker to see if there's any red flags and specifically look for the battery itself, battery longevity <clears throat> and, um, the otherwise, uh, if, if there is no other issues, we just send the patient to the clinic to make sure they follow the pacemaker, uh, the ICD, if there's any need for battery replacement. Could I just add on to that? Mm -hmm. We've had recently, especially in people who have heart failure devices, they could have alarming from increase in the volume load, the Optiville, or they could have alarming also from a, a, a range of impedance that's very high. So you want to make sure that there are no issues with probably lead fractures. So as Dr. Abu Nawara said, that there are multiple reasons why the device could be alarming. It comes down to the uh, alert program that's been placed. Um, so, um, you know, that absolutely needs to be interrogated um, for you to find out the reason. Dr. Osama Bhilil, in the question of the hematoma, if, if someone comes in with a hematoma, uh, how do you manage that? Uh, and you can comment also on the beeping ICDs for Libya. If someone presents with beeping ICD, what do you recommend for the emergency room setting? Is there a device that's available, a program is available to check the device or not? What is the setting in Libya? The truth is, in the ICDs, we usually send patients during daytime, morning, during working hours to the, to the clinic. And we uh, we assess. For we uh, we ask our colleagues and um, reassure the patients. With the canal, everything is okay. Yani, if it's shock, so ECG, quiz, everything. We uh, ask them to send the patient in the morning, uh, working hours to the to the clinic to check. شين الكوزم تاع البيب هل هو باتري هل هو ليد هل هو امبيدنس هل هو فلود اكوموليشن إذا كان فيه ال ال heart failure devices هذا ماي. Usually we manage them. During the clinic checkup for the clinic, that's business for the ICD babes. And you stabilize the patient, make sure the patient is not stabilize the patient, make sure everything is okay. If there's any emergency, ECG is okay. Reassure the patient and ask him to come to the to the to the to the device clinic in the morning. Do you think it's reasonable if patient is dependent to keep him overnight watch him? No, dependent, مريض يعني مثلا يعني أو صار له ICD shock. Dependent. أنا أو shock. This is completely another story. Mm -hmm. Shock, this is something else. Shock, yani shock uh, we sent the patient. Beeping, beeping, beeping. Yeah, 
او بيشنت از ديبندنت و بيبينج يعني ود يو فيل كومفورتبل لتنج هيم جو هوم ويزاوت بينج تشيك والله موست اوف ذا تايم البيب يعني في تايم معين في العدد 8 8 ان ذا مورنينج يعني حسب الديفايس فاذا كان البي الصوت انقطع بس ممكن يرجع تو لا هو بس نضيف البيبينج ان يوسف اهم شيء از بيشنت ستيبل اور نوت ذن يو كان ديتيرمين ذا كوز اوف ات از ات um something acute needs to be done and uh, things to be changed uh, or you just uh, needs to be watched and that interrogation is the key for this and uh, patient everything is okay clinically he's okay i will usama قطع الخط شويه usama تفضل usama uh sorry uh, yes abd al ghani Uh, I just got a good comment in the municipal interrogation of the ICD if there's an appeabing is to make sure patient is stable and then you interrogate to look for the cause and deal with it after. Uh, but you don't need to keep the patients, all patients in emergency unless there is an issue with the patients. Yeah. Unless there is an issue. If the patient had a shock, this is com- completely another story. But if the patient was just listening to the sound of the beep, then it could be, as you said, a lead uh, problem, something else. But if the patient had a shock, then we have to different keep him in the hospital. Different, completely different story, yes. Right, so it's important in hematoma. I mean, there's a point that I've heard needle. Should we stick a needle in a hematoma? Contra- <laughs> completely, absolutely contraindicated to stick anything inside the hematoma. Tamam, well, that's, that's perfect. Everyone has to know. Even in America, there are people who say anything to the hematoma. Yeah, they still bring it up. Yeah, sticking a needle hematomas absolutely uh, should not be done. Yeah, we get infection. That's the simply the, you're 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 giving infection to the patient. That's that's yes, simple. Yes, yes, yes. Don't touch it. It will it will resolve by itself by itself. Just call sponging, painkiller, and a door that can help patient and the pain and that's it. But I usually give antibiotic also just to prevent infection. So we don't stick the needle. Give antibiotic actually. Yeah, but Nadia, no. uh, do you give antibiotics if someone has a hematoma? This is kind of a bit maybe uh, debatable. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 do. I do. If someone has a hematoma, uh, I do give antibiotics because I think blood is a good medium for bacteria. It is debatable, uh, but I still give antibiotics if they have a considerable hematoma. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you, and Dr. Sam, so I'm going to you, if someone has a uh, pacemaker, And you look at the ECG, there are no spikes, and you're not sure. Uh, what, what what would you do, Doctor Nadia? Maybe you can fill us uh, fill us uh, answer this question. So, so Doctor Bunawara, in the beginning, the talk, he elegantly put up the the BPEG NASPI um, chart, where you have the five criteria of whether it's DDD, DDDR, DDIR, what whatever, and that's because there are some people that have the pacemaker implanted just. As a backup, they don't require pacing all the time. They have intermittent sinus node disease where they're once or twice a year, they have a long pause where it needs to atrially pace. So you could see an ECG with completely normal intrinsic complexes and the pacemaker and, and a patient still has a pacemaker. So it doesn't mean that the pacemaker is not functioning. It does mean that you need to make sure that the patient has complexes and they're within acceptable range. So if the patient has complexes, but they're um, 40 beats a minute or 35 beats a minute and the patient has a pacemaker and not an ICD, you start to worry um, because even an ICD, um, the programming lower rate is usually 40 beats a minute generally. Um, So if you have a patient who has complexes and their tachycardia, um, so obviously that will be above what the uh, lower rate of the pacemaker is programmed at. So normal kind of intrinsic rates between let's say 60 to uh, uh, beats a minute and above, I wouldn't worry. Uh, But if you see um, heart rates below 40 and they have a pacemaker, um, then yes, you probably need to worry regardless of what type of pacemaker it is. Uh, تمام دكتور أسامة قصبي عند سؤال يريزز هاي. ممكن نضيف بس حاجة بسيطة سريعة يوسف هي two things يا أسامة القصبي بالنسبة للانترنسك إذا كان هو الهارت ريت 
less than my god dr nadir less than 40 or 50 check the uh, lower rate of the icd the patient sometimes in the chart or in the pacemaker interrogation you'll see the lower rate so if the heart rate's sitting sometimes icds you put them lower like 40 or 50 and you see heart rate of 50 or even 40 is still okay but if you're if the sitting of the pacemaker is 60 and see a heart rate of 50 or 40 then uh, there must be a, a problem. The other thing you may consider is put the magnet on it. Magnet will tell you with the magnet rate if there is intrinsic rhythm. And uh, when you put the magnet, we'll switch to the magnet rate with AV pacing or V pacing with the magnet rate 80 to 100. That will help you a lot. Come on. Just one point to add. Go ahead, Sam. Sam, I'm going to talk about the Libyan لا لا جوه ديما السؤال هذا في الـ في الـ في الاسعاف اسعاف القلب البيشنت هل هو البيس ميكر فانكشن ولا اور نوت الحقيقه انا ديما نقول للجينيورز راهو البيس ميكر عنده تو فانكشنز سينسينج اند بيسينج يو هاف تو تشيك فور بوث از ذا بيس بيس ميكر فانكشن ويل فروم ذا سينسينج بيرسبكتيف اند از ذا بيس ميكر سينس وركينج ويل اور فانكشن ويل فروم ذا بيسينج بيرسبكتيف سام تايمز يو دونت سي ذا سباي You have to see, to see the QRS complex. Hal huwa endogenous or anna huwa based QRS complex like in a spike because it's on a bipolar uh, lead. Sometimes the spike is very difficult to see. You have to look for it between the, uh, I mean, and the uh, uh, leads, either chest or limb leads. So sometimes you have to look for the spike, but this is, uh, this is not an indication that the base maker is not functioning. Well, then the base maker is working as sensing and pacing. Not seeing the basing spike does not mean the base maker is not functioning well. It could be an indigenous rhythm of the patient. This is very good. If not, sometimes it's a basic rhythm, like in a bipolar spike is very small, sometimes very difficult to distinguish from the ECG. Yeah. One thing you can do is increase the amplitude. Yeah. Uh, 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 yes. 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 دكتور اسامة القصبي اعطينا زيدنا من الاسئلة الكويسة نتاعك تفضل وفي حتى سؤال او سؤالين ثانيين ويل جونت ادريس اولسو من دكتور حنان دكتور خالد تقريبا اسامة القصبي ما سمعش فيها باي ما بين هيز جونت جوين تقريبا كان في سؤال Uh, من على البي ام تي من الدكتوره حنان البيس ميكر بيتيت تاكي كارديا uh, اعتقد ان الدكتور عبد الغني غطال هي يعني يو كان تشينج يو كان بوت ا ماجنت وريموف ات ماجنت ويل بيزيكلي كوز اي سينكرون سبيسنج او بيزيكلي بروجرام تو في في اي اور اي اي يعني ذات ويل ستوب ذا بي ام تي او هيز اون ميوت اوكي هيا نرجع اسك تو انميوت يا جو هيد خلاص يا بحال ايش سامحني بس ما الميوت كان اون ما قدرتش اه سامحني والله اوكي يوسف صعب شويه التعامل معاه مش زي مش مش زي الجماعه الثانيين مش زي ايمن مش زي ايمن ما شاء الله يعني المهم سامحوني ماي سنسير ابوليجيز اي ديدنت ميك ماي كويستشن كلير اي جيف يو جود شانس ذات اكشلي لاكي ان يوسف ما شاء الله اعطيك مرتين هذه زي ما قلت لك ماي سنسير ابوليجيز اي ديدنت اكسبلين ماي اي سي جي كويستشن ويل وات اي ميت واز Let's say that ECG shows a paced rhythm at 60 with wide QRS complexes, and you don't see the pacemaker spike. And I think Dr. Sam Abhilil and Dr. Yusuf answered that you have to do something with the machine, or it's the type of lead that might not be the ECG machine or the type of lead uh, that you can't really. Uh, uh, yeah, just increase the gain on the on the spike, so you see the spike. Right. Yeah, that's uh, actually sometimes a good sign because the pacemaker requires very low voltage. And you see the um, the spikes are very tiny. If you see a very large spikes, actually it might be uh, there's a problem with the uh, pacing threshold and patients requiring high voltage. We see it with the unipolar leads, uh, the old leads, or sometimes uh, if they, um, there's something happened to require a high voltage. So for the ICD beeping, just something that uh, I've seen done in our pacemaker and ICD clinics is that they actually. Um, Uh, induce the beeping to the patient uh, just after uh, insertion so that it knows what these alarms are. So they actually hear it. Uh, and they go, okay, if you hear this beep, it means this. If you hear this beep, it means this. And it's mostly meant to alert the patient, not to alarm them. But in any case, they need to seek medical attention. 
So maybe a good thing is just to get the pacemaker, the ICD clinic, the ICD clinic mostly, to go through the beeps that the patient uh, may hear from the device. Yeah. Uh, another question about uh, hematomas, when, if the patient's on oral anticoagulation, should we stop it or not? And a question about oral anticoagulation, how quickly after uh, pacemaker ICD insertion can we start oral anticoagulation? Uh, Dr. Usam Hilid, can you address those questions? I know Dr. Usam. The oral anticoagulation and uh, and what else? The antibiotics are healthy. Asif, just that the net متقطع. Sorry, Dr. Yusuf, Dr. Usam. أنا أسمع فيك الآن يا. أسامة تسألت على ال 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 بالنسبة لل when do we stop anticoagulation or if we stop anticoagulation والسؤال الثاني بالنسبة للانتيبيوتيك صح؟ لا لا أنتيبيوتيك أنتي 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 باي ان نخلو دكتوره عبد الغني ممكن يجاوب لحد ما اسامه جوينز اوكي يا انتي كوجليشن از فيري كومن از يو نو سبيشلي فور افيب اور ميكانيكال فالفز ديبندس اون ذا تايب اف اتس نواك اتس ايزي تيبيكلي وات وي دو هير وي ستوب ذا انتي كوجليشن ذا داي بيفور اند ذا داي اوف ذا بروسيجر اند وي ستارت ذا داي افتر سو ذات ستاندرد ذاتس وات وي دو هير كابل اوف دايز نوت مور ذان ذات تو ريديوس ريسك اوف ستروك اند اولسو تو ريديوس ريسك اوف بليدينج So stop the uh, NOAC the day before the procedure and start the day after. If there's a hematoma, it depends on the size. If it's mild hematoma, we just we continue. We don't interrupt it. It's large, then we interrupt it for a few days, but not very long. And uh, if it's warfarin, uh, warfarin will stop at five days, but it depends on the type. It's mechanical valves. Uh, there's evidence actually nowadays we don't even stop it. I keep the uh, warfarin on INR usually 2.5. Uh, I am I'm comfortable with doing uh, pacemakers with INR uh, less than three, preferably to between two and 2.5. And there's no need to stop the warfarin, uh, but you have to be careful. There are certain techniques to prevent bleeding, prevent afterwards hematoma, and close monitoring of the INR to make sure it doesn't go up to minimize risk of bleeding afterwards. There's evidence that if you interrupt the uh, anticoagulation with warfarin and put them on heparin infusion, that it will increase risk of bleeding. So try to avoid bridging for those patients. Uh, that's what we do here in our center. We don't bridge them. We just continue warfarin, but we stop NOACs two days before and we started after a day. For the warfarin, we started the day after the pacemaker if interrupted for certain reasons, but preferably not to interrupt it. So the only bruise control study that was done showed that bridging doesn't help. So we don't, don't use Lovenox, don't use heparin. Uh, then you continue warfarin. If we bruise control too, that showed even you can do it on DOACs. I mean, if someone is in DOAC, they have a high chance of a score, four or above, you can do it if they're not an aspirin. I'm comfortable. I've done lots of patients with high chat score. I don't stop the wax either. Yeah. And yeah. also post stinting. So if you have recent stint and you need a pacemaker or a patient on dual chamber, dual antiplatelet therapy, I don't stop them. But you yeah. have to be careful. There's more risk of bleeding. So you have to get do the strategies with the good banding and then cauterization, things yeah. like that. Close okay. monitoring of the patient to minimize. So, um, قطعتك بس we're running out of time. خلينا نشوف الدكتورة نادية بعدين we'll wrap it up. يعني دكتورة نادية, what's your approach for anticoagulation? Similar approach. You have one one a similar approach. Okay. So similar approach. وفي I have a question for Jab. إن ال ال name of study is Bruce Control. I can write it Bruce Control one, Bruce Control two. There's strong data. في دكتور خالد mentioned something just to wrap things up on infection. The infection, I think that's the biggest part, the biggest bulk of what we discussed today in our Q and A section. And then the infection, you have to treat it, remove the device. That's the main thing. If it's a staph or gram positive, you have to wait until the blood. There's different approaches, of course. The blood cultures have to be negative. If it's if it's infected, we're going to do it. It's a longer wait. Compared to maybe just the pacemaker and the leads, again, there's might be different approaches. Uh, 
uh, I think that kind of summarizes it in a, just a few uh, words. Dr. Yusuf, there's one question here. I don't know if we address that. Uh, Osama yeah. Buzgi, I think he's asking about uh, bank and gent, peri procedure for pacemaker implants. Osama and Abdul Ghani answered they use cephalosporin, uh, uh, um, but you can answer that. What's, what's your approach? No, so, so the reason I wanted to mention this is because the ESC guidelines that have come out for pacing, um, if you're penicillin allergic, you can use vancomycin um, and it should be given up to 90 minutes before your procedure. Um, the, the kefa, the third generation kefa Allosporins um, were part of the PADIT trial, weren't they? Um, but uh, our approach here in the UK is because the concern is mainly for Staph aureus and particularly MRSA infections. So we use tycoplanin, and in some we use tycoplanin with a stat dose of gentamicin. So that's our 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 preference. Okay, sounds good. Uh, our our approach here is uh, vancomycin for if someone is penicillin uh, allergic to penicillin and cephazolin if they're not so uh, that's that's the approach and then how much do you give it's two grams uh if they're above 75 or if they're smaller maybe one gram for uh, cephazolin anyways i, I we're, we ran out of time uh, I, I thank everyone uh, dr abdul ghani excellent presentation well done um and dr nadi shukran for your participation you've covered great points uh, dr osama shukran jiddan for osama bhilil وشكرا لحضور كلكم على تواجدكم معنا طبعا هذه جروب افورت واحنا نحاول ان وي ليرن فروم ايتش اذر لو في اي اسئله او اي حاجه يو كان اولويز جيت ان تاتش يعني ليت اس نو اف يو هاف اني كويشنز وير اكسسبل على ويذر فيسبوك ولا على الفايبر ومشكورين جدا وان شاء الله ويل لوك فورورد تو ذا نيكست سيشن ان شاء الله السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام ورحمه الله السلام عليكم. 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 السلام ع